Welcome back to the series of lectures on um, Western civilization. I want to talk about the bubonic plague or the Black Death for a few minutes. We've talked about the Mongols and uh, uh, how the Mongols had sort of unified Eurasia in the uh, 13th, 14th centuries and uh, allowing for safe passage for travel, allowing for uh, extensive trade uh, between Europe and Asia. Uh, they inadvertently uh, did something else, and that was to carry uh, the bacteria, the, the, uh, the bubonic plague bacteria, which exist uh, in fleas. And these fleas catch a ride with the Mongols, who are of course nomadic, and uh, they travel, uh, the fleas travel across Eurasia with the Mongols. And um, this results in one of the greatest demographic disasters in history. I've seen different uh, arguments about the demographic uh, loss here, uh, a quarter of the population, a third of the population. I heard one historian say it approached half the population of Eurasia. So I guess that historical debate is still going on. Nevertheless, it's obviously uh, a disaster of great proportions. So I guess the context for this would be uh, uh, the Mongols. This is uh, an inadvertent part of the Mongol Empire and Mongol uh, expansion across Eurasia. And the greatest significance, I suppose, uh, of the Black Death, there are a few. Uh, the mass death of millions of people is obviously significant in and of itself. Um, the loss of Latin speakers, I've ser I heard some historians say that the loss of Latin speakers due to the Black Death opened the door to the vernacular languages, which will uh, uh, becoming increasingly uh, powerful. And of course, Think about how we organize nation states uh, by language. So we're going to have the demise of Latin and the rise of the vernacular languages, uh, French and German and Italian and English and so on and so forth. Uh, I've heard another historian say that the Black Death, uh, one significance of it is that it weakened the church. Uh, weakened the church because the priest uh, would sometimes refuse to come to the, the house of the dying to give the last rites. Uh, this sacrament, of course, is very important, and if the priest uh, is afraid to come to our house to deliver the last rites, then perhaps his faith is no better than ours. So this makes people skeptical about the church. I want to read a quote here from, uh, for you. This is from 1348. This is from a village, uh, Siena, in Italy. Quote, And in many places in Siena, great pits were dug and piled deep with the multitude of the dead. And they died by the hundred, both day and night. And all were thrown into those ditches and covered with earth. And as soon as those ditches were filled, more had to be dug. I buried my five children with my own hands. And there were those who were so sparsely covered with earth that the dogs drug them forth and devoured the bodies in the streets of the city. There was no one to weep for the dead. For we all awaited death, and so many died, we believed it was the end of the world. That's a very interesting quote. Uh, it gives you a glimpse into a, a world that's almost unimaginable now. Um, the, I want to talk about the social consequences. Uh, with this type of mass death occurring, just imagine your own life in your own community, your colleagues and friends and family, if a quarter to a third of those people you know and associate with are dead in 10 weeks to, or 10 days to two weeks. This is going to cause great psychological uh, trauma uh, to societies all across Eurasia. Um, and again, I want to emphasize that this catastrophe extends from China to Europe. Uh, I'm going to focus here on Europe in particular because this is a course on Western civilization. Uh, you can Google uh, the Black Death or the bubonic plague and you can see the symptoms. The buboes are tumor-like protuberances uh, in your armpits or your neck, behind your knees, and you're growing. Uh, these turn uh, purple and black and then burst. Uh, symptoms include coughing up of blood, fever, uh, and generally um, you die within a week of the onset of symptoms. So this is a very, very bad way to go because the people around you are fearful of being near you because uh, the stench that your body emits and people believe that it's the stench of the dying uh, that causes them to get sick. 
So people are going to avoid you once they notice you have symptoms. So let's talk about some of the social consequences, the psychological trauma of the Black Death. First, uh, I mentioned priests don't want to come to your house to deliver, to deliver the, the sacrament of the last rites. This weakens people's faith in the church and uh, their faith in, in the priests themselves. Uh, doctors don't want to come to your, to your house either. Of course, there's nothing the doctor can do. Uh, medieval medicine sort of begins and ends with uh, leeches. And um, medieval medicine is nothing to write home about, I can assure you. Uh, we may talk about uh, the contents of medieval pharmacies later. Nevertheless, people's faith in doctors and in the church is diminished. The, uh, there's no infrastructure to take care of mass death. There, there are no funeral homes. There's no, uh, there's no running water. There's obviously no electricity. There are no, there's no sewers. There's, there's no way to handle this type of catastrophe. So bodies are left laying in the streets. Uh, you got pigs and dogs eating corpses in the streets. Uh, houses are abandoned because of a dying or dead person uh, in the house. Someone dying of the plague. The stench is there and people want to get away from it. So this is, um, this is uh, very difficult to imagine just how profound an impact this will have on the average person's life. Dead bodies are thrown into bodies of water, uh, creeks and rivers. You can imagine what this does to the people downstream if they use the water. Uh, the plague does not bring people together to console one another. The plague drives people apart. Again, uh, it's the fear of the stench that uh, makes people uh, run away. In fact, you may get a chance to read a classic. Um, it's by Boccaccio. It's called uh, uh, the, the, uh, the Decameron, meaning the 100. Uh, a group of people flee Florence during the plague. They gather uh, in the woods there and they tell stories around a campfire to amuse themselves as they await death. On top of everything else, we have famine during the, during the plague. And this is because the agricultural workers are, uh, have fled or have died. So um, for those who have not been impacted by the plague, uh, they may face starvation. And I know this is hard to believe. Here in our society, you can't throw a rock without hitting a restaurant. But in medieval Europe, there are no restaurants. If the harvest doesn't come in successfully, you starve to death. So the plague uh, makes matters worse in that way. And then the last thing I'm going to say here about social consequences is that, there, is that there is a breakdown in law and order. It's not just that the local sheriff is dead, but there's a sense that we're all going to be dead in two weeks anyway, so let's live it up. Let's do what we want. Things which otherwise uh, we would be restrained from doing uh, through religious faith or through law or convention and tradition. Now it's like, who cares? We're all going to be dead anyway, so let's, uh, let's do as we please. I want to talk for a minute about remedies uh, for the plague. Um, again, there's a belief that it's the stench of the rotting bodies that's causing us to get sick, so we need to get away from those bodies or burn those bodies or dispose of them. Uh, there are other uh, causes or beliefs in other causes. And one of the obvious is God. Uh, God has destroyed the world once. Is He angry with us for our sin? And is He and is He destroying the world again. Um, so remedies. The flagellants, uh, and, and we'll print this word so you can, you can see it, uh, the spelling, uh, is from the French verb flagell, to whip. Uh, flagellants will gather themselves in a parade, strip their clothing, put um, crowns of thorns around their head, uh, carry crucifixes, burning incense, and they will parade themselves, march from village to village, whipping themselves or whipping the person in front of them while the person behind you whips you on the back. Uh, this is an attempt at public penance. This is a demonstration to God, look, we know we're sinners. We are punishing ourselves for our sin. You don't need to punish us further by inflicting the plague upon us. Uh, I can recommend... Um, uh, one of the classic films, Ingmar Bergman's The Seventh Seal, uh, there's a scene there that uh, beautifully depicts the flagellants if you get a chance to see it. Uh, but this public penance is um, uh, 
a proposed remedy, uh, an appeal to God. Other remedies, flight, that's the simplest one. Uh, we just mentioned uh, the Boccaccio's uh, Decameron, where the characters flee Florence to get away from the city and from the stench of the dying bodies. Uh, there's a group of remedies that go under the title of aromatics. And you can Google, Google this yourself. Uh, uh, you can Google uh, the plague and uh, aromatics, and you'll see pictures of people walking around with masks, and with uh, the mask will have a large beak, perhaps, and the beak will be stuffed with rose petals or rosemary and thyme and parsley and things that smell nice. Aromatics. The idea here is, is that if it's the stench of the plague that's making us sick, then perhaps we can fight off that stench with something that smells good. We can mask the stench of the dying bodies uh, with potpourri. Uh, you see this with um, uh, other variations on this theme um, with incense. To mask the smell of the plague, in the Pope's chambers in the Vatican, they burnt, they uh, they kept uh, fires going, and the smoke uh, was believed to mask the stench of dying bodies. Um, now, aromatics is tricky because if, if you believe it, then you can take it to its logical conclusion. If we can fight off the stench of the dying bodies with potpourri. Can't we also fight off the stench of dying bodies with something that smells worse? So we have reports of people dipping their, uh, their clothing into latrines and then wearing the clothing. The idea here is that the stench on us is so great that we, it'll combat the stench of the dying bodies. Uh, people bathe in their urine. We have reports of this. Um, so these are extreme measures to take, but if you believe it is the stench that's causing the mass death, then it does make some sense. These, um, these remedies, of course, are all futile. Uh, today, uh, the plague is easily uh, contained and combated uh, with modern medicine. Uh, but of course, we didn't have modern medicine in the 15th century, in the 14th century. Now, uh, a couple of words about public and private hygiene, since we're talking about all this nasty stuff. The, uh, the average European peasant lived in a, a thatched hut, uh, had no foundation, so easy access to snakes and varmints and uh, rats and roaches and what have you. And of course a thatched hut with a, a spark will go up in flames. Uh, people's diet was very monotonous, very little meat. Uh, people did not drink water for the most part. They drank, uh, they drank alcoholic beverages, uh, beer. Ales, wine, um, they wore the same suit of clothing most of the time. Uh, it's not unusual for entire families to sleep in the same bed. It's not unusual to bring livestock into our hut uh, as sort of a portable heater uh, and as a uh, flea catcher. Again, we don't have any notion as the fleas is causing the problem. Yet if a, uh, a flea is annoying where he has, whether he has uh, the plague bacteria in his belly or not, so this is a society without basic infrastructure, without running water, without sewers and sidewalks, without the capacity to deal with a catastrophe of this size. Um, I want to reiterate a couple of those significances because we'll talk about them again. Uh, the diminishment of Latin speakers, the rise of vernacular speakers, the, uh, the early blow against the church, creating skepticism in the minds of some. Uh, about the church. And in that regard, uh, I want to say that uh, many of these people and their skepticism believe that the church has lost its way. Uh, the phrase imitatio Christi, uh, from the Latin to imitate Christ, the original mission of the church to be Christ-like, that the church has lost its way. And we'll see this uh, again when we uh, talk about the Protestant Reformation in the early 16th century. So um, I'm going to uh, end there and uh, uh, we'll pick up uh, with the Reformation later. Thank you very much.